Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 87th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Curatorial Assistant here at the Rail, and I have the, sorry, the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Wardell Milan and Alvin Hall. We're also thrilled to have the poet Adjoa Garji and Zinga Greaves here, who will read to close today's poem. And now to introduce today's host and guest. Alvin Hall is a financial educator, award-winning television and radio broadcaster, best-selling author, and art collector. His recent broadcasts include The Green Book from BBC Radio 4, Alvin Hall Goes Back to the School from the Takeaway PRI with WNYC, and his children's book, Show Me the Money, which has been published in 20 different languages. Hall lives in New York City, where he's completing a memoir of his childhood and his first podcast series. Driving the Green Book, which will be available from Apple Podcasts this coming September 15th. Wardell Milan is a visual artist who makes work on paper, painting, mixed media, videos, and photographs. Milan combines drawing and photography in collages and three-dimensional dioramas. Milan sustains a thoughtful inquiry into the nature of beauty and the unconscious, touching on topics such as body modification and gender performance. And his most recent exhibition was at David Nolan Gallery in Los Angeles titled Death, Wine, Revolt, Uneventful Days, continuing his exploration into voyeurism and spectatorship, reflecting on acts of spectatorship versus participation, power dynamics, liberation, and penance through sexual submission. He lives and works in New York. And with all of those words and all of that energy, I will pass this over to you, Alvin, and thank you both very much for being here today. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Wardell, when I approached you about the idea of doing art about death for yeah. the Brooklyn Rail when I was guest critic, what were your first thoughts? Um, I guess my, my first thoughts were, uh, one, what an interesting kind of article to, to write about, to think about the, the idea of death, uh, but more importantly, like, how am I kind of forcing that already in my work? Mm -hmm. And how can I contribute to, to, to the project, to the writing that, that, that you were, were considering? Um, and with our, our exchange, you know, I, I quickly began to think about the, the collages that I was making at the time and continue to make now using the, the photographs um, and the photograph pages of Maple Thorpe's Black Book. Um, and, and how I use those, those pages, not only as canvases, uh, to create new, uh, new, new imagery, new works, but, but also considering the, the models uh, and, and the, the men that he photographed uh, in that body of work, uh, and considering them in that work in ways that, that perhaps is a, is a bit different from the discourse that, that we normally read about or normally discuss when, when, uh, when speaking about that, that body of work. What was interesting to me that in our discussion, you talked about how you were trying to capture these images of the black men who were featured there from a black point of view. And because of the way the drawings were done, I entitled the article Pentimenti, not, mm -hmm. uh, not evoking a, a, the remnants of a painting, but the remnants of lives. And yeah. I think that was one of the most interesting aspects of what you tried to do with these works. And I think we should look at one of them now as you try to talk to this first work and show how you try to capture those images. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, like I mentioned, I wasn't interested in really the, the fraught conversation about Maple Thorpe being a white photographer and going into uh, a, a, a community that doesn't have the power to represent themselves and he's, you know, photographing representing them. We really wanted to, to, to consider the, the lives and the individual um, the individual worlds that these these men lived during that time, um, because a large part of me feels as if I am a descendant of of them, of these these black gay men who lived in New York during the late '80s and early '90s. And with that consideration, um, the considering considering their their lives uh, and and many of their lives that were short lived, um, you know beginning to imagine the types of gifts that are the gift uh, that, that an individual or these individuals um, weren't able to, to present or to give to, to, not only to their own specific communities, but to, to the world because of 
of their lives, their lives being short lived uh, due to, to, the, to the AIDS crisis. Yes. Um, so it was, it was important for me to imagine, to question, to envision uh, mentally while making these collages, the type of lives that these, that these men could have, could have had and, and, the, and the type of, um, the type of, uh, and the number of gifts that they could have, could have given the, the world. Yes, let's look at the first image right now. If we could have the first image come up, I wanna talk about that one in particular. So this is called Ernesto. And this is one of my favorite images of the work that was published there. And for me, it evoked all of these memories of people that I knew, but in small bits. So by collaging it, what you did, you created an unsettling image in a funny way, but it also has an elegance to it. Every little bit of it seems to be from a different person. And it is both that combination of the sort of allure of it, but also the unsettling of the collaging that makes it so strong. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, that the one in most of my work, I'm, I'm very much interested in kind of this, this uh, oscillating back and forth between wanting to be welcomed and wanting to be seduced by the image, but at the same time, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a moment of wanting to be repelled or, or questioning how much, uh, how much one wants to participate or how much one wants to welcome the image into um, into, their, into their, their viewership. So in this image here, and, and again, thinking about the lives these men, these men lived, uh, and, and, and also using a, a number of different reference and source material to create this final, to create an, an esto. Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely a, 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 an unsettling, unsettledness to, to the image. Uh, because there, because, you know, Yes, there's beauty and there is uh, joy and celebration within this, this, these men's lives. But then there's also extreme struggle, not only as it relates to uh, the crisis, the, the, the disease of, of and fighting, uh, fighting the AIDS crisis during that time, but also racial uh, inequality, economic inequality, all the things that we are kind of still questioning and, and fighting today, you know, these uh, these men, this, this group of, of black men who were living in New York during, you know, during these late '80s, early '90s, yes. all of that kind of struggle was even was even heightened um, during that time. So I think that that I'm definitely considering all of these these historical moments and these historical facts when when creating the, this this new work. Yes, let's go to the close up of this because for me, there's also the look of. It looks like you looked at a medical book or a study of phrenology yes. and you sort of blended all of this and the way you make the cuts, especially the cut around the ear, is particularly fascinating because it's both elegant, but you can see that you're adding that onto the other person's head. Um, the musculature around where you have the paint around the face suggests the underlying structure. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's really beautiful, but again, it's a little scary and it's a look and it, it's both celebratory, like an African mask head, but also suggests a certain decay at the same time. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think, again, that goes back to, you know, to uh, my, my, my interest in, in dualities uh, and the interest in, in this idea of two-ness and, and, and wanting to have that fragi fragility along with something that feels very uh, strong and firm. Um, to have something that, that feels as if it's both coming and then it's also fleeting. So I think that that, that, that constant interest of mine uh, uh, in, in this idea of having these dualities happen uh, simultaneously, um, subconsciously, consciously, is, it always plays out in, in, into the work. You chose to give these works names. Why? Based on the person. Because sometimes you choose more elaborate names. But in this case, you specifically gave them names. Yeah, because again, I was, I was thinking of, of these men as, as, as my like, antecedents, as, and I'm a descendant. So, so with that, I, uh, I definitely felt as if they, they should have person, that they should have, um, they should have personal history. Uh, and 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 I thought that and I believe that giving them uh, names as as opposed to collage number four um, aids in, in in pushing along this conceptual idea that these men um, either have 
lives or are, are continue to live, to live in some sort of way. Yes. Let's move on to the next slide because I think this is one of your best. Um, Thank you. Talk to me about this image and how did you create it? Um, again, using the pages from Mabel Thorpe's Black Book, uh, I believe I used maybe two or three, um, <clears throat> two or three different uh, pages and, and portraits uh, of the men that he photographed. So normally, well, actually, I think with this one, these are discards. So uh, like the chin and the lips, and then also the the eye that that is, and and well, yeah, the top part of of the collage. They probably look like they're scraps or remnants from other collages. So they're just kind of you know the pieces of the of the page that I left over. And I oftentimes like to give myself challenge challenges to to keep the the, the making the, the art making process interesting of how I can make an image in a new way. Uh, so these, these, these pieces were most likely laying on the side of, of the cutting board and thinking, how can I use them uh, and, and to make a collage in a way that had not been uh, previously. Um, and then the, the drawn image uh, most likely comes from three, or, well, let's just say probably two different source materials. So again, looking through uh, different periodicals, magazines, trying to find interesting up the image in that way so the you know I'm not exactly sure how this image began but uh, most likely it began with those discarded pieces um, most likely began with those discarded pieces and then you know introducing the drawn eye and placing the discarded piece on top of the paper and, and slowly arranging the pieces and parts into in, in, until we get until we get this final image what's so powerful about this is your use of the word discarded pieces and discarded images, because if you think about the social justice movement that's going on now, we're looking at all those lives that were discarded, right, because of police brutality, because of social injustice, all of this thing, and then you try to bring those lives back together, bring the focus on that and create a, a person, a portrait of a person. This is pretty good. This is really strong. Thank you. Uh, I know that in your work, you also want the viewer, as I said earlier, to remain unsettled. Yes. And this is one of those cases where you don't settle in this work. No, I mean, I think it's, I think it's at least for me, I believe that it's, it's important for the, the viewer, the audience to constantly question and to perhaps never be comfortable with looking at the work. Um, not because I want them to feel unease, but I think that, that what I'm trying to speak about is um, once you get past what it is you're looking at, are challenging, are challenging conversations. And so I don't think that, 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 is, you sh that one should just be able to, to sit back and, and passively speak about uh, what it is that, that I'm, I'm trying, to, uh, trying to amplify with the work. But I think that, that you have to be a bit, or you should be, a bit uncomfortable, a bit unsettled, um, uh, nervous, and and um, wanting to hopefully uh, once when they walk away, wanting to 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 be proactive and 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 respond not only to the work in in, in a in a real way, but also just kind of to their in their own their own lives and their own their own cultural uh, social uh, uh, bubbles or, or worlds that they live in. Do you see your work as haunting? Uh, some people may. I, <laughs> I, I'm curious. Yeah. Um, let's just say I hope so. I hope people are haunted by it. I hope that they, 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 that they you know, they continue to, uh, to think and, and uh, question and, and um, be visited by the ghost of, of some of these collages once they have walked away and spent, you know, time away from the work. Or that the eyes will evoke memories of some friend or some relationship or something like that. That's what I think is haunting about this. You can't tell, for example, if the eye on the right is angry, fearful, uh -huh. momentary, just shocked in the minute. And all of that creates this really interesting tension in this particular work. This is quite different from the next work, which I want you to talk about uh, if they pulled that one up. This one has a long fascinated me. So if you could talk about this work. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that in the 
in my work, I'm, I'm constantly interested in, about the body, um, how the body moves, and then also how one body interacts with, with the next, with, with another body. And so in this piece, you know, Mapplethorpe has, has, he already kind of set me up for, for creating or thinking about body of movement in an in a eloquent way. Uh, so when, when looking at this, the, the, the original image and, and deciding how I wanted to, to, uh, to appropriate it and cut it up and use it as my own, I really began to think about you know, not, only, not only movement, but also how to dis dismember, frag fragment a form and then piece it back together so that either the movement is amplified or um, or that we begin to think about body and musculature in a, in a way that, that is uh, a bit more focused. Um, so, so in this piece here, I, I like the idea that the, the body and, and the movement is really articulated by the, this curvature cut that happens in the middle of the, of, the, of the print and then how that movement works up from the foot to the ear and then that leads you to the hand that reaches out into Oh, and over the over the page of the of, of the of the work, um, and then the idea is hopefully that that all that movement leads off to the page, and then you can begin to think, well, what's happening beyond the perimeters of this collage? Um, yeah. I know that one of the things you're very interested in is adding in time element, the time, the movement through time in these works. Although they're you know on paper, you want to add that element. I think you do this one successfully. I think what's interesting about that particular work also is that it looks more like choreography. Yes. So you think about Bill T. Jones, you think about uh, uh, Paul Taylor, you think about Alvin Ailey even, and the dynamic quality that's involved in right. creating choreography. And this has that sort of moment when the body is moving and then it may temporarily disappear from view because the move movement is so fast. Right, absolutely. Yep. And then the way the foot is at the bottom um, is sort of like the point of stability. It's very elegant. And this is that balance in your work, isn't it? Between the elegance, yes. the power of the movement, and the body. Right. Absolutely. Um, and, it, and again, I think that, 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 that's carried out through, through the whole practice, even when, when thinking about medium and how I use mediums uh, and how I'm just physically using the material. There's, a, there's always a... Uh, a back and forth between ele elegance and, and power and then spontaneity and, and perhaps um, uh, a casualness to, to, to the material, to the mark making. Yes, yes. So let's stop with the images for a moment and talk and then we'll bring up the next set of images in a little while. So we can stop with the images for a moment. Um, so when we first met, I still remember you were studying boxing, I think. Yes? Yes, I was, I was training in boxing, uh-huh. Yeah. So tell me, what was attractive to you about boxing? Um, you know, I really uh, like the a great one. Well, one, I needed to put my aggression somewhere. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like the agreement that that uh, these two um, fighters come to when they enter the, the the ring. There's this. There's a consent, and there's this consent to. Of, of exchanging of, of affliction of, of, uh, of violence. And so I thought that that was really interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I still do. But beyond that, there is a, there's a strange kind of elegance in the training of, of boxing, uh, in the movement of boxing. Um, and, you know, as you were just mentioning about choreography, there's, you know, there's, there's a choreograph that, that, that kind of happens in the in the process of 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 the match in the process of this of this exchange. Um, so I, I I very much was and still continue to be you know interested in in all of those things um, as it relates to boxing and as it relates to uh, Krav Maga and, and other and other forms of of um, both martial arts and 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 you know combat training. Yeah. Yes, this, the extension of that arm in there and the face in that last image to me echoed that interest in boxing. And yeah. most people also don't know that you're originally from the South. Yes. Where are you from? Knoxville, Tennessee. Yes, and you spent some time at your uh, Mama Esther's house, didn't you? 
<laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> that was your grandmother, yes? My grandmother. A lot of time, a lot of time in uh, West Tennessee, in Reeves, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Reeves, Tennessee is about as, as large as my studio. Yep, yep. Yeah. And it was deeply Southern, wasn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. And having been raised in the South, you know, and I'm a Southerner too, that we have these ways of behaving. I said, we're raised in these small towns in the South, and there's a way you do things, and you, you know your limits, in essence, and right. you have to give yourself courage to go beyond those limits, don't you? Absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes in the studio I read, you say, am I really going to go there? Do you really say that to yourself? Yes. <laughs> uh, you know what? Yeah, let, we'll just go there. We'll just go there. Yeah. Really? yeah and, that's, and that's what you did with the next body of work we're going to look at, which uh, is so not commercial, <laughs> right. so about raw emotions. Talk about the clan work and how it evolved. Um, it, 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 it evolved, it really began with a conversation I had with one of my neighbors. Uh, I live in East Harlem. And one of my neighbors, who I, I love a lot, we, we get along, we have a perfect relationship. I installed the, the, the AC unit in her bedroom a couple weeks ago. But she and I exist on the, the totally different ends of the political uh, um, spectrum. Spectrum, yes. And so we were having a conversation during the, uh, during the election of 2016. And, you know, I was just like, what are you talking about? And, and so we would have, not heated debates, but, you know, we, we would have these exchange, exchanges. And at some, at some point, I was like, you know, let me, um, let me consider what the world looked like using the opposite side of, of the telescope. And I hadn't started making the clan drawings then, but, but I thought, you know, well, what is, how, how do these, how do the other, other people, you know, what are they seeing in the world? How are they moving through the same, the same landscape that, that I'm traveling through? Um, and so with that questioning and when, and, and starting to think about that, that's, that's what led me to, to make these clan drawings. And I, I didn't want to make these portraits without considering the individual behind the hood. And, and I wanted to take the conversation out of uh, perhaps what most imagine like the clan as being, as being uh, you know, a group of uh, white hooded figures standing in the, in the woods with uh, flamed uh, crosses and, you know, and chanting. Um, but, you know, they, they actually are uh, CEOs and they live in the Upper East Side or they live in suburbia, Orange County, California. So really to, to think about um, how, how white, where white terrorists actually live and how they function in the real, you know, how they function in, in, in culture in, in, this, in a serious, real way. Yes. And so you launched this work in Los Angeles, correct? Uh, yes. It was the first time that, the, that this body of work had been seen in, in earnest. Yeah. It was in the, the solo show in LA. And it was a big campaign, as I understand. Could you talk about the campaign? Uh, yeah. You know, David Nolan Gallery and David Nolan, they were very uh, uh, generous and, and, and ambitious with, with, our, with my ideas and then ultimately our ideas with with having like billboards um, in LA on Hollywood Boulevard, actually a few blocks away from the Oscars. Um, we had bus stop posters all around the city. So, and, and, and uh, those posters and, and billboards are actually still up because of the pandemic. Um, so, and that was, in, that was in January. So, you know, there was a, it, one, it was it was interesting to see these images live outside the uh, outside of a white cube, outside of a, of a gallery space, and how people were interacting with with these clan portraits um, on, at bus stops and billboards. Uh, folks sending me like text images or or messages on Instagram. So let's look at one of them now. Sure. Yep. Because so I think they're really strong and unusual. So could you talk to me about how you put together this face? Because it's both scary and the eyes could be from anywhere. It's just, and the mouth is open. It reminds me of just so many horrible things, like a horror movie, perhaps. Uh, yes, 
Um, well, I mean, similar to like the collage work, these, these portraits, um, the faces are composites of, of many different faces and source material. The, the actual mouth is, comes from, from an anatomy book uh, where the, the corpse, um, his mouth is, is, um, is a jar, is opened, and the study, the, the illustration actually looks down into the throat. And then the, the eyes come from perhaps two different sources and as, as well as, as the nose and ears. Um, so I, I really try to get the, these portraits, these faces to a certain point where I'm only just having to respond to what it's asking for. So I, I, I believe I started with the, the mouth, that open mouth, and then just allowed for, for the, uh, for the work to say, this is kind of what I need and don't need um, to to become to become a, an interesting an interesting portrait. But I definitely enjoy the idea of, of this of, of it being like this three headed. I mean, excuse me, this three eyed um, uh, monster man, um, and and the and 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 the hood really not concealing most of his of his face. Yeah, it's that balance of grotesque and intrigue that's in your work. Was this one of the first times you use a full colored background like this? And why did you choose red? Uh, no, I have been using uh, colored backgrounds for about a, a year or two uh, before making this work. Um, these are all hand dyed papers. So we, in, in the studio, we, we hand dye these papers, which is, which is quite a project. And I used red as a, as a way to, to, to invite the viewer into the drawing so that when they see it across the, you know, across the room or um, from a distance, you know, that red becomes very seductive and, and it, it kind of hopefully lures them in. And then once they are lured in and they get into the, into the drawing, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm here now and now I'm confronted with, you know, a Klansman and, and this now, now, hopefully they say, now I have to have this conversation about what I'm looking at. Um, so so uh, the, the red and, and and the fuchsias and the pinks that are used on these to, to color the ground um, is really a way to to uh, to fish my to fish the viewer in. Why do you have it just floating there by itself? It's like infinity or timelessness. Yes, we'll go with that. Oh, um, <laughs> 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 uh, huh? You know, I I don't I. That is a good question. That's not something I, I have really given, and perhaps I obviously should have, uh, given more consideration as to why it, it is floating there. Um, but I think that, that part of it is really wanted to just kind of center on, on, on the face, to really just put focus on, this, on the idea of it being a, a portrait. Uh, so I have an interpretation for you, because no. I've looked at this image, and if they could bring up the next image, that would be great. Uh, um, I think that by doing this, you show that this could be anywhere, anytime, any place. And while people think these things may be something of the past, they could be today. And as you said, by putting it on the background like that, you really make people look at the image and think about different aspects of the image. In this case, the nose, that little that mouth, which you can look at as a snarl, but it's really the mouth turned upside down. Mm -hmm. um, it just has all of these little subtle things going and you have to pay attention to the image and who knows they might see this image in somebody else's face on television when they see one of the people right. yelling at something right and it may evoke this image that's what i that's that's always been my analysis as i first saw this work well i i very much like that analysis we'll, <laughs> we'll go with that <laughs> tell me about how you install this work in a gallery uh, with the show that we had in LA, we, David, uh, David Nolan, they, he and the gallery really um, wanted to champion the idea of, of, of transforming this, the white cube into, into a space that is um, almost more like a lounge boudoir, is that the right, the right word? Like a very, like a space where you can come in and it's very comfortable where you just want to spend time and, 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 and sit down and relax in. With clan imagery, <laughs> with, with the clan imagery, right, 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 right. So the the white space was transformed, and we had this really lush red carpet. We had these really uh, saturated red walls. 
velvet uh, uh, curtains and uh, really amazing plush velvet um, lounge and, and sofas. So the, the whole space had this very kind of modernist um, uh, feel to it. And then on the walls, you have these, these clan heads and you have uh, imagery of, of clan families, excuse me, a, a family of clan members sitting at their breakfast table having coffee and, and eating their cereal. So, you know, it goes back to, to the idea of, this, this, of having dualities. You walk into the space and it's very, um, it's a very kind of luxurious um, space where you want to spend time in and sit down and, and, and quite literally smell the tulips on the coffee table. But when you search the walls and look around you, there's all this very um, uh, disturbing uh, imagery uh, that, one is, that one is welcomed and, com and confronted with. Did you feel the irony when you walked in the room, the sort of banality of it all and how commonplace that type of evil is? Did that, could you feel that when you walked into the gallery? You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't, and the reason why I don't know if I can answer this is because I'm so, you know, so close to the work and to the process of the installing of the work. Um, and so when I walk into it, I just kind of see my, you know, my, my kids on the wall and then they've been birthed and now they have their own lives. And so I'm, I'm kind of like ready to, to, to say, you know, have a good life, goodbye to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so my relationship to the, to the work and to the show is, is, is obviously a lot different from those who are, who are, who are initially uh, seeing the work and, and coming into the exhibition. So did, did anyone ask you if this work came from a place of anger? A place oh, everyone asks me that. Everyone thinks that my work comes from a place of anger. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is? <laughs> uh, sometimes it does, I, I, absolutely. But, uh, but no, this, this, this work, a lot of this work didn't come from, from, from a place of anger. It really, most of the work comes from a place of contemplation and, and really wanting to, to, to consider how I can have uh, conversations that, that I'm either having with my friends or with those who are in the studio. You know, how do we, how, do, how can I, um, you know, describe or articulate this, these exchanges, this dialogue that I'm having with these people visually. So oftentimes that's where the, this, these works are coming from. So it really was inspired by your neighbor and contemplating your neighbor's uh, different politics during that period of time. And that was the source of this work. Right. But it's also very Southern because you were born in the South and these are images that we would have seen growing up uh, in small towns in the South, especially. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So let's move on to the next body of work we want to talk about. So. Uh, no, we want to get, a, we'll come to it in a minute. We can go back to, we don't need any images up right now. Okay, good. That's it. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I know about you is that you are very much attracted to films. And one of your favorite films is by Fellini. Yes. Talk to me about that, please. Um, well, I mean, I love the carnival -esque. Um, and what I appreciate about Fellini is how he's able to thread in his auto parts of his bio and in, 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 in these fantastical uh, movies and worlds that he creates in his, in his uh, cinema. And so I, perhaps not so much in the current work, but in my, uh, in, in the work of, of the recent past, I've always been, I've always tried to, to thread in my, my own personal history within uh, these larger uh, narratives that that I'm I'm hoping to to um, to create in in both the works on paper and also in my photographic work. Um, so you know my I, I love Amacor, uh eight and a half um, and and particularly Roma when thinking about how Fellini uses his personal narrative to create these uh, these carnivalist uh, 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 films and, and landscapes. Um, and so, and so, tapping into to um, uh, to my life history as a way to, to inform the, the work that I'm making, and most often times it's it is is coded are are people who are close, like you could 
would, would see the work and be like, oh, I know what he's talking about. But most yeah. oftentimes, you know, uh, people are, are unaware of, of, um, of, what they're, how, of knowing that what they're seeing is actually calling to, to my own personal history. I remember when I first started seeing the dioramas that you did, we would, friends of mine and I would look at them and we would say, oh, let's find Wardell in these and, <laughs> <laughs> and look for images of you in them. Right. But while you like Fellini, you also have this unusual interest in Kung Fu films and television shows, don't you? I do. I do, I do. I definitely pull a lot of uh, references and images from film and, and from like Kung Fu uh, imagery. Um, some of my earliest memories is, is being downstairs in my, in, in the first home, first family home we lived in and watching on Sunday, Sunday afternoons after church, of course, after church and going downstairs <laughs> and watching old Kung Fu movies and TV shows while my mother was upstairs um, cooking dinner and listening to the gospel hour on the radio. <laughs> so that, that's one of my, one of my, er, some of my earliest memories and also fondest uh, memories. But, but definitely, yeah, those shows and, and that those films have, have still have uh, importance into the work. And so it seems as if this new body of work that you've been doing for the past year takes all of those images, your, those ideas, boxing, kung fu, all of that, and sort of brings it all together as you create these narratives, these yeah. almost cinematic narratives in them. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Let's look at one of these new works. And if you could talk us through it. This one. So the, <clears throat> this image, it, it really began uh, with the photograph. So I uh, participated in the Rauschenberg residency in 2017. And while I was there, I, I took a number of photographs of the property um, and so the, the black and white photographic image of the, of the landscape is actually, um, I believe they call it Jungle Road. So it's a part of the Rauschenberg property. Uh, so you, you know, you're, we're looking at palm trees. And so I was taking, making these images and, and photographing the, the landscape of, of the residency, not knowing exactly what I, how I was gonna use these, 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 these photographic images or how I was gonna even use the, the photographs, the prints themselves. But once I returned to New York and I started looking at the images and I started considering how I wanted to use them, um, I, I had printed out one, one image and it measured about 40 by 60 inches. And it was on the studio wall for a number of weeks. And finally I decided to, to use the image as, as a canvas. So this, to use the image the same way I'm using the pages out of Robert April Thorpe's Black Book. And so once I had, had, had got to that point in, in thought, um, I just began to, to create like these white spaces and scratching into the photograph and making these marks onto the, uh, onto the photograph image um, uh, in an attempt to, 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 learn, uh, to learn where I wanted to go with the process. And, and through, that, through that, that understanding or through that, through that learning, learning uh, task, uh, I came to, to to what we're looking at now. Uh, and these two figures, the figures are still, I'm still using uh, the pages and the photographs from Maple Thorpe's Black Book to, to help build and inform the, the figures themselves. Um, but I, I wanted to take the conversation um, beyond not only the source material of both the Rauschenberg landscape and the pages of Black Book, but to begin to think about how uh, men of color, how black men, how the, those who live on the peripheral, you know, how do they make spaces where they can find, um, where they can find a sense of, 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 of freedom, where they can find affirmation, uh, liberation. So, so in making this work, that really became the, the, driving, the driving force behind these landscapes and these spaces that, uh, that I was creating, you know, to create a space of, of liberation. Yes. Did you look at much African sculpture when you were doing this work? Because that's automatically what I thought of the first time I saw this, the position, the hand, the body, uh, it had that feel to it. Although you, although it's called Kung Fu, it does feel like very ritualistic African sculptures to me. 
No, no, I wasn't. I I tend not to, to look at much of anything when I when I start making real when I start making bodies of work, and mm -hmm. when I'm really into the, the middle of, of, of that process, uh, just because looking begins to inform. I feel like inform the work for me and and really direct specific ways, which I I I think um, this allows for me to, to to find my own kind of authentic uh, uh, aesthetic um, or reference. So I try not to look at, at too much. So, um, so no, I wasn't looking at African, African mask or, or uh, any type of uh, specific reference material or imagery during this time. So what artists influence you? Who, what artists do you look at? You know, I return to the same artists I have been inspired by since high school or undergrad. And it's, it's uh, you know, Francis Bacon, uh, de Kooning, um, uh, oh gosh, female artists, sculptor, spiders, mm -hmm. Louis uh, Louis mm -hmm. um, you know, filmmakers, I continue to look at Fellini and, and Quentin Tarantino. So I, I really just, yeah, I, I, I stay with the, the artists that, that have influenced me from, you know, since I was, you know, 20, 19, 20. Uh, and look at not only their older work, but also those who are still alive, uh, the, the work that they continue to make. Yes. I love your use of uh, plants at the bottom of this. And I always think about what I read about your summer spent with your uh, Mama Esther and the field across from her house. And I always right. think these images must come from that. Could you talk about that summer and what, would, what was across the field? Yeah. Um, Across from my, my grandmother's home, who, who the house was also the size, well, the house is the size of my desk. Um, <laughs> across the field was a, um, this huge nursery. And so they had everything from, you know, magnolia trees to, to pumpkins. Um, and so I, you know, I remember walking out of her home and, and it was just like acres and acres and acres and acres of, of, of all of, of this nursery and, and all of these um, botanicals and, and, and trees and, and, and um, vegetation. So I think that, that that definitely continues to influence uh, the work and my use of botanicals. Yes. And in this image, yes, there's, there's leaves and there's um, these cutouts of, of, of floral, floral, but also the, 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 the blue uh, objects and, and mark making is a reference to the bower bird. And so the, the male bower bird and his mating process, he creates one, he creates this really elaborate bowery, this really elaborate, elaborate uh, nest. And once that nest is, has been formed, he will go out and uh, find all these blue objects to bring back to his nest to adorn his home. And it's, I mean, it's like hundreds and hundreds of pieces of these, of these random blue objects. And it's all an attempt to make his, 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 himself and his home attractive. Um, for 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 a mate, so it's all about him his uh, courtship. So I like the idea of of, of bringing that um, that 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 way of, of courting, that way of, of adorning your your home, uh, of of adorning yourself, uh, of affirming not only yourself and and the space that you created and live in, but uh, affirming the one that one that you may court or the person that you may love. So so that's. And that's how these blue objects and, and forms were introduced in this in this drawing and, and and similar to how I interject my own personal history into the work you know and that fact is lost I'm sure on many when they come to the work unless they have either seen a video of, of this bird and his courtship or you know they, they learn as they are learning now through through a conversation yes and I love this the, the wars of warriors are fumbling toward a reconciliation and that sort of dance is going on as a part of the fumbling. Right. Uh, let's move on to the next image, please. And this is also one of your new works, also taken uh, based on uh, your, t your residency. Yes, the, um, the photograph is an original, original image, um, yep, taken on the uh, Rauschenberg um, property. Beautiful. 
and you are very interested because you often blend bodies from men and women together. You had the Smooth Girl series about body, uh, female bodybuilders and right. how they transformed their bodies and sometimes distorted their bodies. And here you have that sort of blending of that body of work too. Right, right, right. And that, that, that definitely goes back into my, my interest in, in Polak uh, uh, binaries and, and polars and, um, and thinking about what, what exists on, on the opposite ends of, of the positive and negative and, mm -hmm. and, and examining and, and imagining all the gray that exists between the two poles. Um, because I think it's far more complicated than, obviously, than just um, male, female, or gay, straight, or, you know, whatever, whatever the two poles are. Um, and so I'd like very much to, to, to be swimming in the middle of that and, and making imagery that, that really questions, um, that really questions the, all the different shades of gray that exist between, between the two poles love your hatchwork in their limbs because it makes them seem if as if they're dissolving into the background. They become more ghostly or they start out ghostly and when they leave that white space, they become much more solid, but in completely grotesque or just distorted ways that you cannot figure out what you're looking at. Yes, 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 yes. Thank oh, you. Very interesting, very interesting. And the blue is there again. Wow, quite great. And next image, please. This is one of the newer works you've done. I love this. I love this. Thank you. Could you talk to us about it, please? Um, yeah, so this is titled Pulse. And it's, it's a direct reference to the Pulse nightclub. And um, when making this, this image, you know, I was listening to the news and, and obviously listening to uh, you know, the report about uh, this massacre as well as you know, the, the, the numerous reports that were, were, were being broadcasted about the, uh, the murders of, of unarmed men of color uh, by power structures. And at this time, you know, I wanted to, to have a, a more political voice, voice in the studio and with the work. And I wanted to respond in a way, well, I wanted to respond to what I was listening to. Um, and in this piece, I wanted the, 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 that response to be both celebratory, but, but then also um, to, to think about those individuals in that club moments before, uh, before terror is, 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 um, is strikes upon them. And so, you know, in, in this drawing, it's really just imagining what, again, those on the peripheral, uh, the space that they created for themselves to feel affirmed, uh, and to and to love and to appreciate one another and to appreciate themselves, and to perhaps you know express their interior selves in a way that they aren't able to outside of this space of of affirmation, um, and then how how these spaces not only here in, in Pulse nightclub but but also you know, thinking about the Uptown Lounge in, in New Orleans and, and how that how that gay nightclub was was also. Uh, terrorized and, and burned down uh, in the late uh, 80s, I'm excuse me, early 80s. And so, so questioning how these, these spaces um, not only are hold an, an extreme importance to the LGBTQ community, but I can, you know, we could go on to think about black churches, small black churches, and how those spaces serve as these spaces, these safe spaces. Um, but how these, these, these structures, um, these um, these rooms, these clubs, these spaces of sanctuary, how they can be infiltrated and, and destroyed. Um, and, and ultimately how those who occupy these places, how their lives can be, uh, can be destroyed by, by hatred. What I love about the progression of works we've looked at is that they're all about the human soul, the human spirit, about people finding a respite and how your imagery evokes not only specific individuals, but sort of an every man and every woman and every person and every they uh, out there who is seeking identity and some kind of peace. And I also think the work beautifully evokes memories in people who may have known people, a friends, family who may no longer be with us, but you look at that cheekbone, you look at that ear, you look at the head shape, 
in one of your images, I always think of my brother Andre because his head was exactly that shape. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I thank you for the, that evocation. Uh, I think now we can take some questions. If there's some questions out there, Nick, this is a good time. Absolutely. And I just want to thank you both so, so dearly for what was a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you. We, we have tons of questions. I don't know if we can get to all of them, but I will first take, pass the mic off to uh, Victoria Sancho Lobis. Um, Victoria, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, but Sure. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So Hello. Great to you. Um, thank you both for this fabulous conversation. What a, what a treat to listen to you both and see uh, this compelling work. Wardell, you did address this in um, the, the last discussion of, of these uh, images coming from your residency. Um, in the Rauschenberg Fellowship, but I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about um, you know, how you engage with different media. I know you've, you've also started working with printmaking. You're such a gifted draftsman. You paint, um, you know, also independently from your collage work. And I'm just curious in terms of your process, if you, if you know in advance the medium that seems to suit a particular body of work before you begin it, or if you begin with the imagery and then it finds expression in uh, whichever medium at whatever scale, you know, suits it the best. Right. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, I, I definitely allow for the, the idea, the initial kind of concept uh, and, and what I want to say to dictate the medium. And a lot, sometimes I choose the wrong medium at first, um, but I, it, it, while while making work, I'm constantly like moving back and forth between painting, drawing, sculpture, and building the dioramas. So everything is happening simultaneously, um, and I'm I'm most oftentimes having a number of different of of um, kind of set conversations are are um, are points of topic that I want to speak on happening at the same time. And so it's really trying to trying to decide like what is what's the best way to, to articulate or to, or to, or to have that conversation uh, visually. Um, and oftentimes it does start with, with drawing just because that's, uh, I, I started out drawing when I was in you know, third grade. So that is my, my comfort zone. Um, but often, not oftentimes, but a lot of times that, that, isn't the right, that isn't the right medium. And the right medium is to build a diorama or to, um, to use the pages of, 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 of a magazine and make a collage. Um, so it really is a bit of a, of a um, pulling something out of a bag and saying, let's see if, if this is it uh, before I have a true understanding as to whether it should be a painting or drawing or if it should be a, a, a collage work. I mean, it's funny you ask, I mean, that, that's kind of what happened yesterday in the studio, um, walking around and starting a piece of work that is, it works on paper and like, uh, no, I, this isn't it. And then going and, and, and it should be a painting on panel. So um, it's definitely, that's definitely part of the, of, of, the, of the process. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, hold on. Wait, I, I do, Victoria, I want you to be able to, I saw you speaking. Can you? Oh, I just want, I just said thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Excellent. So next, I would like to pass the mic over to Charlie, our managing editor, who has a kind of a follow-up question, kind of in the vein of what Victoria asked. Uh, so Charlie, I believe you are able to. Yeah, thank you, uh, Wardell and, uh, and Alvin. Really uh, beautiful, inspiring conversation. My question is sort of a follow-up, uh, as Nick said. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about your research research process and uh, what sort of things that you've discovered that have made a meaningful impression on your work. Um, well, I'm, I, I, I try to, particularly like right now, when I'm at the, the beginning of making new work and new bodies of work, just absorbing, kind of just absorbing everything. 
Um, so reading the Financial Times to, you know, the new issue of Vogue to watching um, um, the BBC show White Chapel on Hulu. So it's, it's, it's really just kind of taking in a, a number of, of, of media, media and, and reference images and material uh, to, to inform the work. Um, you know, right now with reading like New York Times, Financial Times, I, I, I keep reading and, and, and searching for, for articles that speak about the Bronx neighborhood and how that neighborhood, that borough is dealing with um, the current pandemic. And not only the neighborhood, but how the, you know, the residents of that community, how they are particularly devastated by, by this pandemic. And this morning I was reading how, um, how the small, the, most of the small businesses in the Bronx, how, how they almost got uh, no financial benefits or no financial uh, uh, services from the number of, of loans that were given out to small businesses here, here in, the, in the city. Um, 66 percent of that money went to small businesses in Manhattan and then nine percent went to Queens and the small businesses in the Bronx only one percent of that of that money went to small businesses in the Bronx. So you know with that in this article and with that knowledge is, is like yeah I how do I bring that back to the studio to further the conversation about inequality, um, to, to aid in, in the argument or the conversation about um, communities that are on the peripheral, how they are ignored, ignored either through, you know, through the delinquency of financial aid or through, um, through inadequate health care. But these are the same people that are, are here, you know, operating and running the city while everyone else has, you know, well, I didn't leave, but how a number of people have left the city. But these are still, you know, these, these, these citizens are here uh, manning, manning the city, but they are the ones that are least valued. So, you know, the research is, is, comes from all, of, all over the place, but, but I, I, I definitely um, uh, use all the, this information eventually to, to inform, you know, what is happening on the walls of my studio. Thanks so much, Wardell. You're talking, uh, you reminded me of something my father used to say, which is that uh, in life, it's exceedingly rare to ever have a good teacher, but a good student can learn from almost anyone. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, next, I would like to pass the mic off to our very own Fong Bui. Fong, I believe you can... Thank you, Wardell. Thank you, Alvin. You're welcome. I'm happy that you also somehow throw in the reference Kung Fu in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, um, I, I appreciate the, the carnival last aspects, which reference to, um, of course, Fellini. And Fellini was born in Rimini, where he lived all his life, although he died there and in Rome, you know, in mm -hmm. the hospital. But nevertheless, Rimini is like Atlantic City in Italy. So it's a very common, it's a banal representation in his uh, sentiment in all the movies. But about Kung Fu, which is interesting because it brings back to the origin of the Shaolin Temple, which is found in the third um, AD. And one of the reasons why Kung Fu was such an effective martial art practice because it's mimicked uh, animals fight, not humans fight. The only humans fight that is um, very difficult to achieve, which is the rhythm of your work. Why listen to you now been talking, it just occurred to me, the most difficult technique of all Shaolin technique is the drunken master, <laughs> the drunken technique. You know, how to fight like a drunk, you know, but without being drunk. So you had to think like a drum. So the rhythm of your work had that dissonance. It's very uh, difficult to really predict where things are meet. They seem to want to meet and collide and somehow form, but they never do. You know, so I'm just sort of figuring out how much of, of you, your time being spent watching Kung Fu movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
How much how much time do I currently spend watching Kung Fu movies? Or in the past. Does it have to be now? Or in the past? Oh, well, when I was young, quite quite a bit, because we went to church every Sunday. So uh, so uh, so um quite a bit of time was, was spent watching um was watching Kung Fu movies on those Sunday afternoons, waiting for you know Sunday dinner to be uh, to be prepared. Um not, Actually, this, I was gonna say I don't watch so much kung fu movies now, but I, but but it's not particularly true. I watch a lot of uh, like Asian combat movies of like Jet Li and uh, you know movies of, of that genre, um, but but not not specifically like uh, kung fu kung fu movies. Yeah, well, I just I just rewatched Kung Fu Panda just the other night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rodell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, it's great to have uh, Fellini and Kung Fu come together. But right. speaking of, um, I just just now got a question kind of relating back to Fellini. So, um, Pierana Cavalcini, I hope I said your name correctly, but I am going to pass the mic off to you, you should be able to ask your question. There should be a prompt to let you unmute yourself. Can you hear us, Tirana? Hi, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned, Gordel, you mentioned Fellini earlier, and, and, I, and I do think his films have kind of this diorama quality to them. It's that magic of his films that are like that, and and I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about your diorama work and how you know you move between 3D and 2D. You seem that's such an interesting form of going from one to the other, and and Pellini does it in another way in a cinematic process. But if you have time, if you could say something more about what how you how you've approached that. Um. Yeah, with the um, with the dioramas, I. I see them and, and the, the making of them as, as actually more cinema. So um, now with the current dioramas actually that I'm making now, but with all the ones in the past, I would build them with the, with the camera. So I use a, a large uh, four by five camera. And so I, I would go back and forth between looking through the viewfinder and slowly building the diorama. Um, and, so the, so, and so really kind of thinking about about the the three dimensional space that I'm that I'm creating as a as a film set, and I even today I think of the the little you know cut out paper people that are placed within these these landscapes and within these spaces as actors, um, but I, I don't I, even though the, the process is different and and the way in which space is is understood and and um, and manipulated is different. Than, than working on paper. Uh, there's not a huge shift for me from, from making a collage or drawing on, uh, drawing on, a, on a piece of paper. Uh, there's not a huge shift from that to, to creating the diorama. Because I, I, I guess I, I'm still questioning and, and deciding how to use space. So with that, I'm still considering the, three, the 3D uh, but it's just, but it's just like how how am I interpreting that 3D mentally? How am I interpreting that uh, uh, with material? Um, so so th there's yeah, I, I guess I, there's not much hesitation between moving back and forth between making these three-dimensional objects, uh, the dioramas, and then then making a, a a collage or a drawing. Thank you. Thank you, Piriana. Um, we have time just for one more question, and I would like to read it on uh, the questioner's behalf. Um, uh, one of our regulars and good friends, Aretsu, uh, asked Wardell, um, her, her exact question was, who are some curators with whom you'd like to collaborate with? And if I may sort of expand on that, um, I'm curious, you know, in, in terms of that sense of collaboration, um, are there any that stand out to you that you've worked with before or any that you really would like to work with? Um, and maybe not per se curators, but- Yeah. Of that. 
kind of collaborate? Helped. Well, I, I, I definitely, I definitely enjoy the collaborative process. And, I, and when working with uh, curators, I always feel like it should be a collaboration. I never want to come to the project to say, hey, this is what I want to show. This is what the show is. I'm very much interested, well, depending on the curator, but most curators are very much interested in what they have to say and, and, and uh, their ideas for the show. Um, so I'm working with a, I'm working on a number of projects uh, now with curators that some are, are already close friends and then some of the curators are, are those that I met you know, earlier this year and are, are quickly becoming uh, really good friends. But these, but these curators are, are really, you know, they're really, they're really smart. They have very uh, kind of clear ideas as to what they want for the project. But within those clear ideas, there's, there's plenty of, of room to be, to be fluid uh, and, to, and to, um, to allow for the project to mature uh, and to expand and contract in, uh, in a very natural way. So, I mean, I don't have a long, it's not like I have a list of curators whom I would want to work with, but I think that I, I, I definitely enjoy working with curators who are, uh, who are, have a very like scholar, scholarly practice, um, who have a historical, like a strong historical knowledge, um, and who are, you know, who are open to, to a real collaboration and open to, to having that real um, collaborative conversation. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky to be working with, with uh, a handful of curators now um, for upcoming projects who, who are very much, uh, who have all those, those qualities and, and those adjectives uh, are quickly applied to them. Well, thank you. I hope I didn't put you too much on the spot there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but uh, I, before we, go to our tradition of ending the conversation, our daily conversation with a poem. Um, I just want to, you know, check in with you, Alvin, is there, are there any last things you want to say or, or, or before we close the conversation, just handing it over to you. This has been eye opening for me. Um, I have followed Walt Darrell's work since he was at the studio museum. And I think his skill as a draftsman has just grown. I think that the work, is continuing to expand its connection to human beings in an abstract way, but also in a representational way, has always just stayed with me. And when I ask him if his work is haunting, I must say for me, it has been since the first time I saw it. I can recall most of the work that I've seen of his over the years, the various bodies of work. And he has a distinct talent and a talent that is growing. So I enjoyed this conversation tremendously. The reference to Fellini, I knew a little bit about, but not as much as I learned about today. And his embrace of the absurdity of it all, sometimes I just love. And he has a great sense of humor. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you both again. It's been a true joy. And um, like Jason Rosenfeld said in the chat, uh, please follow Wardell on Instagram. You can see his, his handle over in the chat. And thank you everyone for your, great exchange in the chat. But uh, as tradition of our rail lunches and our new social environment, uh, we close every day with uh, poetry reading. And today we are really honored to have Adjua Garji and Zinga Greaves. Welcome Adjua. I'm gonna briefly introduce you and then I'll pass the mic over to you. Um, Adjua was born in New York City in 1980 and writes ethnobotanical literary criticism in collages detritus into heraldic devices. Greaves has most recently been published in the Brooklyn Rail and Letters to the Future, Black Women, Radical Writing by Corey Press. Her chapbook, Close Reading as Forestry, is published by Belladonna and a publication with Ugly Duckling Press is forthcoming in 2020. Formerly a Monday, sorry, formerly a Monday night reading series curator at the Poetry Project, Project site director for Wendy Subway and an artist in residence at the Rauschenberg Residency. She is currently based in New York and where she is, uh, apologize, where she is young mother of the Floral Review. So without further ado, Jua, I give you the mic and thank you for being with us today. 
Thank you for having me, um, Wardell and Alvin. I'm so thrilled for um, everything I just got to experience. I look forward to being in conversation with both of you in the future. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. When you hear them say dark, you will know that it matters. They will say it when they mean bleak. They will say it when they mean grim. They will say it and show surprise at your carnation's implication. They will say it and be surprised at your enthusiastic invitation. Cohen said, you want it darker? We kill the flame. Moten said, blacken up. They will say it when they mean a hell zone in which their shields are disintegrating, a hell zone in which their protections show themselves to be towering cages of ivory, a hell zone where ceaseless, a hell zone where the ceaseless rending of their telltale hearts beat. Never more, now than ever, more never, never now, more ever. After 300 years, do I still want this clan of goblin guardians patrolling the boundaries of my existence? Or am I ready to join my families in the cosmos, finally and for real? What better to call the energy bridge of false chasm, sparkle in sunshine, bosom of cosmos, knowing without knowing, making siblings of us all? What better? to call this energy than dark matter. Thank you. Thank you, Adjo, so much. There's a, a wall, of, a grid of people clapping silently right now. Um, thank you for that beautiful reading. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Wardell. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Adjo. Thank you for everyone for the questions. Um, before we part, uh, I would like to encourage you all to join us every day at 1 p.m. where we have these conversations. Uh, same time, same place. Tomorrow we are honored to welcome Martin Purrier and our own editor-at-large, Jason Rosenfeld. Uh, as you, and Mar I see Jason pulling the book up. So now I would like to um, encourage you all, I, I believe you will now have the ability to unmute yourselves, Please say hello, goodbye, thank you, whatever you'd like to say. And thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, for Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you, Excellent session. Awesome. Thank you. 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 Tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Jason. Get some sleep. We're going long. No, <laughs> I'm starting to keep sending me images.